אנו מכריזים בזאת על הקמת מדינה יהודית בארץ ישראל. היא מדינת ישראל. This lecture will be devoted to the theme of religion in the Declaration of Independence. And if Israelis know one thing about the debate surrounding the Declaration, it can be summed up in two words. Tzur Yisrael, the Rock of Israel. The Declaration ends with these words. Placing our trust in the Rock of Israel, we affix our signatures to this proclamation. The debate over the formula is a famous one because some of it took place in public in the meeting of the People's Council on May 14th, just hours before independence was declared. Now, the usual telling of the story goes like this. At this session and at a prior session of the People's Administration, religious Jews and secular Jews clashed over whether they should sign while explicitly placing their trust in God. This went back and forth until Ben-Gurion proposed that everyone sign while placing their trust in Tzur Yisrael, the Rock of Israel. Was it one of the names of God? Or was it simply a reference to the inner strength of the people? It was all in the eyes of the beholder. The formula was sufficiently vague in meaning so that an Orthodox Jew and an atheistic communist could both sign, as they did. It was the first jujitsu between religious and secular in the history of the state, and it set a pattern for the future. Now again, we're indebted to Professor Yoram Shachar for getting to the bottom of the phrase Tzur Yisrael in this context. In fact, it wasn't introduced by Ben-Gurion or by Shertok before him or by Berenson before him. It was in the very first draft of the declaration drawn up by that young lawyer, Mordechai Beham. The debate on May 14th was whether to keep it in, but the ingenious formula had been around for three weeks. The history of how it got there is indeed the story of the interaction of the religious and the secular. But that interaction involved a lot more than just the way the signatories were going to sign. It involved a crucial parallel question. Would the state of Israel formally rest its claim to the land of its independence on divine promise? And I'll anticipate myself by saying this. The earliest drafts did just that. But in the later drafts, all of that was cut out. So that by May 14th, the sole reference to God was the concluding passage about placing our trust in Tzor Yisrael, the Rock of Israel. I'll begin here with what was cut and then come back to what was left. As I said in my potted history of the drafting, the earliest draft was the work of a Tel Aviv lawyer Mordechai Beham, who was affiliated with the legal department of the nascent justice ministry. Beham, born in the Ukraine, son of a lawyer, educated in law at the University of London, and formerly employed by the Mandate Administration, was a totally secular man, unfamiliar with the Jewish sources. He received the assignment to come up with a draft three weeks before the end of the mandate. And he went home perplexed. Well, how would he begin? He wound up going over to the home of a neighbor, one Harry Tzvi Davidovitz. Now, Davidovitz was another matter altogether. He'd studied as a youth in a Lithuanian yeshiva before leaving with his parents for Philadelphia in 1903. He did an undergraduate degree at Columbia University, studied at the Jewish Theological Seminary, and completed a doctorate at Dropsy College in Philadelphia on Arabic influences on Maimonides. An ordained conservative rabbi, he served as a US military chaplain in France during World War I. And he later had pulpits in Philadelphia and Atlantic City and in Cleveland. In 1934, he took a sabbatical in Tel Aviv and he decided to stay there. And there he ran a factory. He also became a translator of Shakespeare into Hebrew. He was the first to translate Hamlet, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Macbeth, The Winter's Tale, King Lear, and Othello. Uh, he also translated Beowulf and the Canterbury Tales. 
Over the years, his own ritual observance diminished, but he was deeply learned and owned a substantial library. And more to the point, Professor Shachar is convinced that Davidovitz, and I quote him, had total faith in the divine source of the right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. Now, what exactly transpired when Behem entered Davidovitz's library, we will never know for certain. But there, Behem did two things. First, as we've seen, he copied passages out of the American Declaration of Independence, and we'll come back to that again shortly. But he also copied passages from the King James Version of the Bible, which related to God's promise of the land. And in particular, he copied this from Deuteronomy. Behold, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give unto them and to their seed after them. Now, why, you may ask, did he copy this in English? He probably thought that the primary audience of the Declaration would be foreign. Uh, and as a London educated barrister, uh, it was no effort for him to collect the material in English. This is the land of Israel as the promised land, given to the people of Israel by divine ordinance. And this is exactly how Beham began his very first draft in English. And I quote it. Whereas this holy land has been promised by the Lord God to our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their seed after them, etc., etc., etc. When he came to translate this passage into Hebrew, he rendered Lord God as Tzor Yisrael, the Rock of Israel, and in a later version also Elohei Yisrael, the God of Israel. It's Professor Shachar's speculation that all of this came to Beham from Davidovich. Behem didn't know his Bible or his Psalms. Prayer was foreign to him. A practicing lawyer, he'd never given much thought to the basis for the Jewish claim to the land. Davidovich somehow imparted to him the biblical rationale, as well as the phrase Tzul Yisrael as one of the names of God. Now, needless to say, this formula was provocative on three counts. First, that there is a God. Second, that he is Israel's special God. And third, that he promised the land to the patriarchs. It seems rather doubtful that very many Zionists, circa 1948, subscribed to all, or perhaps even most, of these assertions. For them, the land of Israel was the homeland vouchsafed to the Jews by history, not a holy land promised to them by God. Now, in the interview recorded in the film Ben-Goyon Epilogue, there is a segment that speaks directly to this point. The interviewer asks Ben-Goyon whether he ever asks God for fortitude, as the prophets did. And Ben-Goyon answers in an almost mocking tone. And I quote him, Does God live in some place where you can contact him? Did the prophets go and see God? They wrote down his address and went to see him? Speaking to God is thinking deeply about something. End of quote. To the extent Ben-Gurion believed in God, and sometimes he did claim to believe in him, it wasn't a communicative God. He didn't intervene, and he certainly didn't make promises. And so it was no surprise that during the subsequent redrafts, God's promise to the patriarchs wound up on the cutting room floor. In later drafts of the Declaration, made in May, history and not God is the basis of the Jewish rite. Thus, for example, we get this version. Whereas the Jewish people is linked from the beginning of its history to Eretz Yisrael. And that was replaced then by this. By virtue of the unbreakable historic and traditional connection of the people of Israel to Eretz Yisrael. So the Balfour Declaration stayed in. The UN General Assembly Resolution stayed in. God's promise to Abraham went out. By the time Moshe Shertok presented his draft to the People's Administration on May 13th, there was no mention of anything prior to the exile. And one of the members, Behol Shitrit, expressed his disappointment, and I quote him, The declaration begins with the people being exiled from its land. 
before it was exiled, there was something, a people that upheld its religion and tradition. And it's impossible not to mention our book of books. Shertok thought all of that would be superfluous. And I quote his response, I deliberately began with the exile. I thought, I can't include everything going back to Abraham. I imagine that educated people know these things. No one denies that the people of Israel inhabited the country and gave the world the Tanakh. The dispute begins with the return of the people to the land. End of quote. And here I'll add a speculation of my own as to why Shertok and the legal department wouldn't have wanted to cite the promise to Abraham. The reason might have been more practical uh, than an ideological aversion to citing the divinity. As we'll see, the declaration would make much of the 1947 UN resolution as a license to create a Jewish state. But that license came with something else, a partition plan, licensing an Arab state, too. When Abraham received his promise from God, it didn't come with a map or an instruction to share the land with anyone else. So in the face of it, the Zionist leadership was giving up half of what God himself had promised the forefathers. And it just so happened that this half included the two most prominent places identified with Abraham. Mount Moriah, where he nearly sacrificed Isaac, and his burial place in Hebron in the cave of the patriarchs. The first was to be a part of international Jerusalem, and the second was to be part of the Arab state. Why then, in the Declaration of Independence, remind the new Israelis of a promise their leaders hadn't realized? And why insinuate to the international community that perhaps Israel wasn't reconciled to partition when one of the aims of the declaration was to win its recognition. If I'm right, then God's promise to Abraham fell by the wayside, not just because the drafters didn't believe it ever happened, but because highlighting it would embarrass the new state at home and abroad. It was Ben Goyon who tried to fill the gap of what preceded the exile when he added a new first paragraph to the final declaration the night before the proclamation was issued. It affirms that, quote, Eretz Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Here their spiritual, religious, and political identity was shaped. Here they first attained to statehood, created cultural values of national and universal significance, and gave to the world the eternal book of books. End of quote. Now, in this formula, the right of the Jews goes back to the beginning. It arises from the birth of the people in the land, and then a series of firsts, but not from divine designation. The world is reminded of the book of books, but God isn't cited as the author, nor is it called a holy book, but instead an eternal book shared by the Jewish people with all mankind. This opening also evades the revelation at Mount Sinai which took place outside the land. A believer might think that the Jewish people first arose there when it received the law. No, says the Declaration, all that was significant in the formation of the Jewish people happened here. Everything is compressed into here so as to strengthen the claim made in the crucial passage of the Declaration. Because there the state is proclaimed, quote, by virtue of our natural and historic right and on the strength of the resolution of the UN General Assembly. Ultimately, these are the two foundations of the claim. Natural right, which echoes Jefferson's laws of nature and of nature's God in the American Declaration of Independence, and historic right, both bolstered by their recognition by the international community in the form of the United Nations. Now, the omission of the divine promise didn't go unnoticed at the time. David Svi Pinkas of Hamizrahi argued in the People's Council on May 14th that the declaration should have opened with this passage. The land of Israel is a land given to the people of Israel according to the Torah and the prophets. Another member of the People's Council Mayor David Levenstein, who headed 
the Agudat Yisrael branch in Tel Aviv, issued a series of reservations after the declaration on May 16th. That was two days after the state was declared. The declaration, he said, and I quote him, ignored our sole right to the land of Israel based on the covenant between God and our father Abraham and the many promises that recur in the Tanakh. And because the declaration failed to understand the land as one promised by God, said Levenstein, it also ignored what he called the special character of our land, a holy land designated for the people of Israel, not just for independent rule, but above all, for leading a life of holiness and purification. So why did these critics sign the declaration, you might ask? It was a moment of emergency. Levenstein signed in his words, and I quote him, in recognition of the heavy responsibility and the danger that surrounds us on all sides. So the peoples of the world would not interpret our reservations over the secular form, the secular form and formula of the Declaration as a division within the camp of Israel. Rabbi Kalman Kahana, an ultra-Orthodox signatory from Poale Agudat Yisrael, said something similar years later. Everything was subsumed under one question, he explained. How to strengthen the security of the state? How to do that so it could withstand the attacks? It was a real matter of pikuach nefesh. And because of pikuach nefesh, we had to make concessions which under other circumstances we certainly wouldn't have made. Now, pikuach nefesh is the principle of Jewish law that preserving human life trumps any religious consideration it might be described as the emergency provision in Jewish law. So it's not that the Declaration found some kind of perfect balance between believers and non-believers and unbelievers. It didn't. But the believers were prepared to sit on their reservations because of the emergency. And because in 1948 they were still very much in the minority. Which meant that while later secular Zionists would tend to view the Declaration as an expression of an enduring consensus, religious Zionists would uh, tend to view it as an expression of temporary exigency. Yes, all the parties had signed it. But some did because of their belief in it. Others, despite their reservations about it. Now, one of the things that made it possible for the believers to sign was the mention of Tzor Yisrael at the very end. Placing our trust in the Rock of Israel, we affix our signatures to this proclamation. Now this too had its origins in Behem's first draft, and it can be precisely traced. Behem copied out the following phrase from the American Declaration of Independence. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. What Behem did was translate this passage into Hebrew word by word, and when he got to divine providence, he again translated it as Tzu Yisrael. Professor Shahar again thinks this is owed to Rabbi Davidovitz's influence, but of course we will never know. The important point is that unlike the reference to God's promise to Abraham, this mention, this mention of Tzu Yisrael survived the many redrafts and the edits until it reached the very end of the process. And it was only towards the end of that process that secularists and atheists raised objections. Their problem was simple. How could they be asked to sign a declaration professing trust in a God they knew didn't exist? Wouldn't that constitute a blatant example of religious coercion at the very birth of the state? The debate erupted on the evening of May 13th the eve of Declaration Day, in the last meeting of the uh, People's Administration, Aaron Zisling of Mapa, Mapam, the party to the left of Ben-Gurion's Mapai, said he couldn't express his trust in anything he didn't believe in. And I quote him, it shouldn't be imposed on me and those like me to proclaim that I believe. I ask for this passage to be deleted. The observant members pushed back hard, and it's worth quoting one of them at length, Chaim Moshe Shapira, 
who had headed the Jewish Agency's Department of Immigration. Since 1934, he would go on to serve as a minister in every Israeli cabinet until his death in 1970. And I quote him, I cannot imagine that in a historic document such as this, the heavenly name will go missing. You needn't be religious, but it's unthinkable, not to mention the heavenly name when we'd stand to establish the Hebrew state. I'm ready to take a poll of all the Jewish heretics on earth to see if they think it's wrong. If someone can't sign the document as it is, then we are unable to sign it in the way it's proposed by Zisling. It's difficult for us to reconcile ourselves to the omission of the God of Israel. Jews are being killed every day with hero Israel on their lips. I would prefer God of Israel and not just Rock of Israel and its Redeemer, but the compromise has already been struck. Rabbi Yehuda Fishman, later Maimon, who had become Israel's first minister of religion, then chimed in as well. I haven't seen an important declaration by the nations of the world where the name of God isn't mentioned, except for Soviet Russia. So Ben Goyon now had a problem on his hand. He made a rapid calculation and decided that it was Zisling who would have to stand down. I am a person like Zisling, Ben-Gurion said, that is a religious skeptic. But I can sign this passage wholeheartedly. I understand what the rock of Israel is, and the proposed compromise is a fair one of Jewish friendship. As we stand on the brink of independence, we have to be careful not to sharpen disagreements. So Shapira, seeing where Ben-Gurion had come down, then pressed his advantage. He wanted to add to the rock of Israel the phrase, and its Redeemer, which would make it even clearer that it's a reference to God. But now Ben-Gurion pushes back the other way. And I quote him, In what is called a matter of conscience, adding just detracts. When you say, Tzor Yisrael, for you it says everything. And I have to be able to explain to my children, who aren't religious, why I signed this wholeheartedly and with a clear conscience. So, the issue may have seemed to have been resolved, but it came up the next day in the People's Council with the same protagonists. Again, Ben-Gurion insisted that the draft be left alone. And I quote him, Each of us, according to his way and understanding, believes in Tzor Yisrael as he understands it. There is no imposition or coercion. Here I express my own Jewish and human opinion. When we say we trust in Tzor Yisrael, I know what Tzor Yisrael is, and I trust it. I'm sure my colleagues on the right know perfectly well whom they trust, and I also know well whom my colleagues on the other side trust. I have a request that I not be forced to put this passage to a vote. They didn't force him, and the passage went into the Declaration as submitted. The question of religion, then, wasn't resolved by the Declaration of Independence. It was finessed. And Ben-Gurion could finesse it largely because five Arab armies were about to invade the country. But it would be a stretch to say that the Declaration split the difference between secular and religious perspectives. Indeed, it's hard to describe the Declaration in the balance as anything other than a secular document. Its peculiar omissions and emphases reflected the sensibilities of its secular drafters, especially in the later stages of drafting. The claim of the Jews to the land is based on history and natural right, not divine promise. Judaism is conceived as something the Jews created themselves, not during a mythic trek in the desert where God appeared to them, but in the land of Israel itself. And the only promises worth anything now were made not by God, but by Lord Balfour and the United Nations. The semantic game over Tzor Yisrael was all about what minimal concession it would require in order to secure the signatures of the believers. In the end, Ben-Gurion managed to put everyone's signature on the parchment and just before the Shabbat came in. But religion, more than any other issue, would later make it impossible to compose a constitution for Israel. The Declaration, rather than move Israel closer to a future constitution, simply reflected the balance of forces at the moment. And since religious factions were then at a disadvantage, 
They had no interest in translating the Declaration into a constitution with the same set of preferences. In the aftermath of the war, they didn't have to. And so there's no constitution to this day, an issue we'll come back to in my last lecture. I'd like to conclude this lecture with two pertinent stories. Rabbi Fishman famously made a small emendation when he put his signature to the scroll. And here he is telling the story. When my turn came to sign the scroll, I wrote my name just like everyone else. But that didn't suffice me. I wanted to add something. But Moshe Shertok, who was supervising the signatories, was alarmed and asked, Rabbi Fishman, what are you doing? You'll soon see for yourself, I told him. He saw how I added alongside my name four letters, Bet Ein Zayin He, an abbreviation of the words, with the help of God. So the good rabbi was proud to have snuck an allusion to God into the signature section of the Declaration. Uh, some might see that as an allegory for religious state relations in the years that followed. The second story relates to the translation of the Declaration into English. Shirtok, ever the diplomat, decided on the evening before the Declaration uh, that there should be a translation into English. Now he knew that Ben-Gurion would insist on leaving Tzor Yisrael in the text, and its translation thus proved to be the main problem. Shirtok worked late into the night with aides who consulted the American Declaration, the Bible in English, and even Churchill's speeches. Part of that team was Faye Doron, an English language editor who'd been named to direct the English language broadcasts of Kol Yisrael, the voice of Israel. And she pointed out that the phrase Rock of Israel would go right over the heads of non-Jews who wouldn't have a clue as to what it meant. Divine providence, she reckoned, would also be confusing, belonging as it did more to the world of Christian than Jewish theology. Jews and non-Jews around the world would expect to see a reference to God. So she proposed that Tzor Yisrael simply be translated as Almighty God. As the meeting wound down, it's already 4 a.m., Shertok agreed. It would be, the translation would be, with trust in Almighty God. The irony was that when the English translation went out to the world media the next day, it didn't contain these words. Uh, they were embedded in the last paragraph of the Declaration. You'll recall that it includes the time and the place of the ceremony. And these were supposed to be kept secret. And even though the ceremony was over and done with, an overzealous censor cut the whole paragraph in press dispatches uh, by foreign journalists. So that when the Declaration was published in America on May the 15th, it didn't include any mention of God at all, which caused some surprise and even consternation. Only when Kol Yisrael broadcast the text uh, did listeners hear the phrase, Almighty God. Now this story has sequels. It's amusing to note that some Orthodox believers in Israel adduced the English translation as proof that Tzor Yisrael, in the Hebrew Declaration, meant Almighty God after all, despite what any secular signers might claim. Here is Rabbi Kalman Kahana, one of the signatories. He said, I saw something interesting. When I read the translation of the Declaration of Independence into English, I saw there was no other possibility but to translate these words as God. And so Faye Doron's translation became the proof for some religious Jews that Tzor Yisrael could only mean Almighty God. And the second sequel. Uh, that 1948 translation wasn't an official one. It was only done for the convenience of journalists. It appeared in the official Gazette, but it wasn't the official translation. The official translation was very carefully compiled in 1962. And what did it do? It overruled the preferences of Shertok and Feidoron. The official translation reads as follows. Placing our trust in the Rock of Israel, we affix our signatures to this proclamation. Now, no doubt, this was the more faithful translation, for it sought to restore the ambiguity of the original. But if you surf on the web and the internet, you'll find the 1948 translation all over the place, often misidentified as the official translation. Of course, today no one has any doubt about the meaning of Tzor Yisrael. Uh, later, in 1948, Israel's first chief Ashkenazi rabbi, Yitzhak Halevi Herzog, 
penned what became the prayer for the state of Israel. It begins, Our Father in Heaven, Rock and Redeemer of Israel. Herzog took Tzur Yisrael and put it in a context where it could only mean God. And Israelis are sure it means nothing else. That's because untold thousands recite the prayer for the state every Shabbat, and there they encounter Tzur Yisrael as an obvious name of God. So the term has lost all of its ambiguity, which was what made it attractive to the, to the drafters in the first place. When Ben-Gurion finished reading the declaration, Rabbi Fishman recited the Shehechianu, the traditional blessing of thanksgiving. This wasn't spontaneous. It was planned. It was a planned part of the program, although many recall being surprised. You're all familiar with the prayer, Blessed art you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has granted us life, sustained us, and enabled us to reach this occasion. A wave of emotion swept the audience. Rabbi Fishman later recalled looking out the corner of his eye. And who did he see? That Apikoros, Aaron Zisling, who tried to keep any hint of God out of the declaration. And this is what Rabbi Fishman recalled seeing. Afterwards, at the museum, when I recited the blessing in front of the nation's dignitaries, suddenly I saw Zisling remove a handkerchief from his pocket and cover his bare head. I think this cuts to the very essence of the paradox of what it means to be Jewish and what it means for a state to be Jewish. It is a nationality, a history, a culture, and a religion. In each individual, as in the state as a whole, all of these elements coexist in different proportions of immediate relevance, but each with its latent potential. How to strike the right balance has been the greatest challenge facing the state of Israel. The debate over its declaration of independence was but the start. And that concludes this lecture. <laughs> Made the desert bloom, revived the Hebrew language, built villages and towns, and created a thriving community controlling its own economy and culture, loving peace but knowing how to defend itself, bringing the blessings of progress to all the country's inhabitants, and aspiring towards independent nations.